Hi guys, Dr. Dillard once again. Here we go on another lecture. This is going to be the two-hour cardiovascular pulmonary or cardi cardiovascular and pulmonary pathology lecture, part of our three-hour block, right? I already did the GIGU lecture. That was kind of endocrinology too. That one's already posted. So this will square us through the morning. All right, here we go. So microcirculation, we were talking about vessels. What is the microcirculation? These are the vessels that are involved with the exchange of gas, fluids, nutrients, metabolic waste. Uh, and that's, that's all nice, but what, what are they? Who are they? They are arterioles, metarterioles, AV shunts, capillaries, and venules. The little guys, right? The, the, that's the micro, I'm gonna talk about the microcirculation time and time again. Here's a nice little picture of the microcirculation. Arterial is here. Venule is here. Capillary is here. In fact, this capillary it's called a, has a metarterial going through the middle of it. Uh, so this is a, most of the capillaries in the bodies, but not all of them are like this. But remember, these little metarterials are cool because they have sphincters here. And the tissue, it depends on the state of the tissue, how hungry it is for oxygen. If the tissue is fine with its oxygen level and not becoming ischemic, these guys close down. They, they, they're regulated for the most part by oxygen is what is thought. Uh, but you can't have all the capillaries in the body open at once, right? You'd pass out. Uh, most of them are closed, they're not most of them, but they're, they take turns being closed. Uh, so these metarterials are actually very important. And if, if you don't need to oxygenate the tissue, don't oxygenate it. And then the blood runs right through into the venule and off it goes. Note the smooth muscle around the venule as well. There's not as much of it compared to the arterial. But because the venule is a vein and it's squishy, it contracts just as nicely as an arterial does, which is filled with muscle. We talked about that before. So here's tissue that's already been oxygenated. It doesn't need any more oxygen. Uh, so this metarterial, arterial, the precapillary sphincters are closed, and everybody's happy. Okay, remember that stuff? All right, but the star today of the show is we're going to start talking about body fluid. So let's talk about that, a.k.a. as body water. Body fluids are present inside of the cells, the spaces of the body, and the blood plasma. Okay, blood plasma. Uh, yeah, so what's the function of the body fluids? Transport metabolites, gases, nutrients, and wastes, among other things, to and from the body tissue. So, I mean, this, this services the tissue. Uh, we need the body fluids, like blood, to, to keep us alive, right? It's found in two compartments, body fluid. So there's an intracellular fluid compartment and an extracellular fluid compartment. The intracellular fluid compartment has the, you probably heard of the ICF, the intracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid compartment has the extracellular fluid. Okay, intracellular fluid compartment, let's talk about that. Uh, so this is basically the fluid that it's inside all of the body cells. It's a ton of fluid in cells, right? Uh, in fact, this is the largest of the two components. About two-thirds of the body water lives here. The extracellular fluid compartment is on the outside of cells. It contains one-third of all body water. It's made up of three subcomponents. Blood plasma has a blood plasma compartment, an interstitium, or the interstitial fluid compartment, transcellular compartment. This one we're going to talk about a little bit. Let's look at these three subcompartments a little closer. The blood plasma compartment spaces and fluid inside the blood vessels is what these are, not include the fluid inside the blood cells. Uh, sometimes blood fluid, oh, sometimes it's called just the blood fluid or the blood water. 
it may push into the interstitium or may be pushed into the interstitium and become interstitial fluid. We talked about that with our little capillary story. Then we have our interstitial fluid compartment, uh, the fluid matrix, and it's not water, right? The cells aren't just floating around in water. It's like almost like the nucleus propulsus. They're, they're anchored inside uh, this proteoglycan stuff material, and uh, therefore it kind of holds the cells in place. This is the largest of the fluid compartment. It can act as a reservoir. So that's the interstitial. We've talked about that. This one's important for us clinically. We have a transcellular compartment uh, and clinically important. It, it includes the cerebrospinal fluid, aqueous humor, the eye, the three P's, right? The peritoneal cavity, per, the plural, uh, plural fluid around the lungs and the pericardial cavity, uh, and joint spaces like synovial fluid. Uh, so this is a, an interesting one clinically important. This one makes up about 1% of all extracellular fluid. Here's a little cartoon showing a, a, some cells and some interstitium and their capillary feeding these cells. It demonstrates everything except the transcellular compartment, but we have intracellular fluid compartments would be inside a red blood cell, and there's just a run-of-the-mill, well, let's say this is the skin of your forearm or wherever. Uh, then we have blood plasma compartment. Well, that's that's the stuff inside inside the blood vessels, not counting the cells though. And then we know what the interstitium is. That's outside. Movement of body water and fluid. All of these fluids are almost completely made of water. Right, water can move across the membranes of cells and blood vessels via aquaporins. We study those today, aquaporins channels. Uh, most capillaries, in fact, use aquaporins 1 channels. Uh, so we didn't, yeah, we, we talked about 2, 3, and 4. We didn't talk about aquaporins 1 today earlier. Uh, but yeah, that's what most capillary use. And they're not powered, they don't require any ATP. The fluid to water just zips right through, no problem. All right, now this, hang on to your hats. This is a big topic, swelling. So there's two types of swelling. Swelling is a general term. If you can't remember which is which and you're writing soap notes, then write swelling. So there's effusion and edema. So effusion is the stuff that is inside the transcellular compartment. So synovial fluid, joints, um, fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, fluid in the knee, synovial fluid, fluid around the heart and the per, uh, pericardial cavity, or the pleural cavity in the lungs. So these are all clinically important. So if you have a swelling inside any of these structures, including your joint, you don't call it an edema. You call it an effusion. Okay, got it? Effusion or an edema is everything else. We talk a lot about pitting edema today and things like that. Uh, interstitial fluid compartment, yep, that's where edema lives. Okay, so make sure you know the distinction. So edema can be localized to one region of the body or it can be generalized. Uh, it can be in your face, it could be all over your whole body, or maybe it's just in a sprained ankle. Okay. Uh, edema typically occurs deeper. It's in the subcutaneous tissue, especially in the lower extremities. Typically first viewed, shows up around the ankles and feet, especially if the affected person is still working and on his feet a lot. That has a name that's called dependent edema. Dependent edema. In fact, because your feet, if you're sitting right now, your feet and ankles are in a position of dependence. Uh, meaning gravity is influencing them. All right, there's a nice example of some pitting edema, patient with liver disease. Uh, so because of gravity, edema commonly accumulates in dependent parts. That's the first place. It might keep going, might develop ascites and other problems, um, but it usually shows up there. 
gravity exacerbates or increases hydrostatic pressure and makes even more blood fluid or water leak into the interstitium and makes it more visible. Generalized edema, that means it's all over the body. You can see it in the face, the hands, the fingers, uh, and the feet. Maybe a little more exacerbated in the feet because of dependence and gravity, but it has to be everywhere. So some common causes of generalized edema. Probably should have more stars on this slide. Uh, kidney disease. So how in the world could kidney disease cause a general swelling? Uh, well, albumin is lost into the urine. Now remember we talked about in our little capillary scenario how important albumin and some of the other blood proteins are. Uh, they're too big to get out into the capillaries, into the interstitium. And they, but they have a force. They have an oncotic type pulling force, if you want to think of it like that. Remember, they return, they return fluid in the distal capillary. So that's really important. If you lose albumin through kidney disease, uh, let's say your kidneys normally don't let protein go into the filtrate, uh, but because of the, if it's an inflammation or whatever. To, ripping up the kidney, you're starting to lose huge chunks of protein, including albumin. And there goes your return force. So your interstitium is in trouble. All it's got is the lymph vessels to try to drain it, and that ain't enough. Uh, nephrotic syndrome is a perfect example of that. So these people will swell everywhere because albumin's lost everywhere. Uh, another one is the... Uh, what if the kidneys can't clear sodium from the blood? Remember, the kidneys dump sodium uh, into the nephron like crazy. And we're supposed to return that sodium. Uh, but what if you have kidney disease and you can't do that? Uh, well, if you have too much sodium, uh, tons of sodium in the blood, uh, the body's going to match that out by, by adding water to it. And so you're going to have too much hydrostatic pressure. You're going to have hypertension. And, uh, yeah, you're going to swell because of that. Malnutrition. Uh, so don't have, uh, it, I mean, it's not going to happen in this country, but in some countries, if you don't get it proper vitamins, maybe your liver can't make protein very good and it's having trouble making albumin. Might as well be losing it then. So you lose that sucking force and you're going to start to swell because of that. Uh, liver disease, hepatitis, um, cirrhosis of the liver, liver cancer. It damages the liver. Who makes albumin? The liver makes albumin. So that's a problem, right? You're going to swell. Uh, if you get burned really bad over a certain percentage of your body, let's say both of your legs are severely burned, uh, albumin will leak out of your blood through the capillaries in the burn tissue, and it might as well be leaking out the kidney, and you'll swell all over the body. I can't remember if I showed you a picture of that, but maybe I think actually I'm going to show it to you in a little while. It's kind of disturbing, um, but we'll take a look at that a little bit more. Uh, and then there's some rare disease. I used to talk about capillary leak syndrome where people are born with these capillaries that all of a sudden freak out and become super permeable so permeable that albumin uh, can leak out. But that's really rare. I took that out. I think that's too rare for boards. And I can't, sorry, I can't warn you when these gross pictures come because I can't, with this program, I can't see ahead. I can't see the slides coming. So uh, so not kind of disturbing right here. So this is, this is a uh, congenital nephrot nephrotic syndrome. Uh, with this little guy, and uh, the nephrons are so dysfunctional that they can't hold the proteins, and proteins, including albumin, leaks into the urine. Uh, and you have uh, uh, albuminuria. You can measure that, right, with uh, some lab testing. And not good. If you lose albumin, you're going to swell all over your body, and that's what this poor little guy's having a rough time here. Uh, because he was born with congenital nephrotic syndrome. All right, effusion. There's a slide on effusion again. Effusion is, I think, sprained ankle. Uh, the patient presents with a moderate effusion. You don't say presents with, uh, well, you could say swelling, I guess. 
presents with a moderate swelling. But you don't say the patient has a moderate edema in his ankle because doctors will read that and they'll think, oh, guys, you got something wrong with his liver or heart or why has he got edema? Uh, effusion means it's isolated to a joint. And yeah, so it's a buildup of fluid in the transcellular compartment. Uh, and who are they? There's words. So let's start with the, uh, the, the, the cavity, the pleural cavity, which is around the lung. We'll talk about that more when the time comes. But uh, if you develop, if you get a fluid buildup in the interstitium there, it spills over into that pleural cavity. And you got yourself a hydrothorax. Gets big enough, it can start causing an atelectasis, a collapse of the lung. Uh, in the peritoneal cavity, same thing. You, we'll talk a lot about this, but if you get, let's say, a beaver dam in the liver uh, and you can't drain blood through the liver, it can spill over into the peritoneal cavity and you can get yourself a cites or a hydroperitoneum. Uh, uh, same thing around the heart. We'll talk about this. Uh, plural or a uh, pericardial effusion from, let's say, in a bacterial infection. It's a bunch of things that can cause it. It's also called a hydropericardium. It's just fluid in that pericardial cavity. Uh, if you get an injury to a joint, a sprained ankle, that thing can swell. That's a joint effusion. It's not a joint edema. If you can't remember, just call it a swelling. But you should remember effusion is what you're going to be using to write most of your soap notes. Uh, you can have a subdural effusion in the brain uh, as well. Uh, so joints, therefore, you do not have an edema in a sprained ankle. You have an effusion. I almost always throw a question like from the slide on the test, hence the stars. So here's an ascites, a hydro hydroperitoneum or peritoneum. Uh, and yeah, that doesn't look right. He's pretty skinny, right, except for his uh, his belly here. I forget if he has cirrhosis, I think. Uh, yeah, his cirrhosis. Um, so yeah, so his liver is all scarred up. He can't push blood through. Uh, and the portal system, remember you have the vena, vena cava going through there? And you have the portal system. It's usually the portal system is the one that gets backed up. Uh, but yeah, it backs up the traffic. The beaver makes his beaver dam in the liver and backs up into the peritoneum, the liver, or the spleen over here. Um, but yeah. So that's ascites. And double whammy. Cirrhosis, so your liver's damaged, so you can't make albumin anymore. You start losing the, the amount of albumin, so that makes you swell even more. But that would be a widespread swelling, right? You'd see that in your hands and feet and face as well. Here's a little cartoon. Little star here, you knew I like my anatomy. Uh, but here's the portal vein, hepatic portal vein. Remember the plumbing here. Uh, so if you get a beaver dam, did I turn on my? Did I turn on my? Yeah, I did. So let's make a beaver dam. So let's make a green one. So we got a big liver cancer tumor right here, beaver dam. So this fluid normally traveling this way. It's having a tough time getting through the liver. So what's a beaver dam to do? It backs up. It'll back all the way up into the spleen and cause splenomegaly. It'll back up into these intestines. So you could get test in ischemia from this. But more likely, some of the smaller blood vessels go and they supply the peritoneum and some of the fluid starts to drip out and accumulate. And pretty soon you got a wave of fluid in your peritoneal cavity, and that's called ascites. Right, same thing in your lungs. Uh, so this is a pleural effusion around the lungs, uh, and you can see, you can see it right down here. Right, the costophrenic angle should be sharp, like that. Uh, so they're not sharp, are they? They're blunted. They're filled up with fluid. Um, so this is called a hydrothorax. Uh, this one was secondary to a pulmonary hypertension. This patient uh, had a failing heart, right? His heart is too big. Got some left ventricular hypertrophy going on here. This looks like he's had heart surgery. You can see the wire clips in here. Um, but yeah, 
Uh, so the beaver dam is the heart, and it's backing up all the way into the liver and into the lungs. The lungs are spilling fluid in where the alveoli are. I mean, eventually you could have some hemoptysis coughing up blood pretty soon. Um, so, yeah, what a mess. What's the cause of swelling? This is, we're going to fall down a rabbit hole here. There's so many causes of swelling. Uh, we talked about a couple already, but common cause is the cardiovascular system. Uh, the heart could be a beaver dam itself, right? We talked about that before. Uh, whether it be just a failing heart, uh, the heart can't pump blood out enough, or whether there's aortic stenosis and the heart squeezing hard, but it can't shoot the blood out a little tiny hole that's not opening. Or maybe there's regurgitation and the heart shoots blood out, but during contraction of the aorta, the blood squirts back in to the left ventricle, and then the heart is overfilled. And that's not a very efficient pump. So any type of valvular disease, whether, whether it's stenosis of the aorta or mitral valve or regurgitation, that can all act as a beaver dam. And so what? Well, it can cause swelling. Um, and here's, I threw that diagram up here. So here's the heart. There's the beaver dam, and we just run backwards to the way the flow went. So pressure backs up. Or if you're talking about a traffic jam here, the cars are backing up and uh, getting really heavy in here. But I like the beaver dam better. Uh, so you're getting a lot of fluid in here. It's filling the costophrenic angles. You can't see those. But it keeps going. It goes into the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart's trying to pump blood through the lungs. It can't do it. The right side of the heart is a wimp. It's not made for that. So you wreck the right side of your heart. Start to have right heart failure. Um, but the the traffic jam, the beaver continues, goes up, goes up the jugular vein, and you get yourself a Kuzmal sign. Goes down to the liver and swells up the liver. You get hepatomegaly, and it keeps going. It goes to the spleen and blows the spleen up. Goes down to the peritoneal cavity, and you get fluid ascites. Goes all the way down to the ankles. So that's what a beaver dam can do. If there's a beaver dam here in the liver, is are you going to have a Kuzmal sign? No. It's got to be upstream from the blockage, right? Anything this way, there's the inferior vena cava. This is all downstream, so it has no effect on any of that. Okay, um, renal system, we already started talking a little bit about how that can cause swelling. Uh, if you have kidney disease, you lose the ability to secrete albumin, you'll get a generalized swelling. Uh, nephrotic syndrome, we talked about that. Uh, Kahn syndrome, we'll you we probably know about that already, but we'll talk about it. It's a hyperaldosteronism, and the, the adrenal gland cranks out too much aldosterone. Well, what does aldosterone do? Uh, it conserves salt and water. If you conserve too much salt in water, uh, then you are going to start swelling eventually from that. Right, we did that. What else causes it? Well, uh, the liver system acts as a beaver dam. We talked about this already. I don't think I have to say that. Uh, how about the hypo, the HP axis, hypothalamic pituitary axis? Sure. You get a hypothalamic tumor, and it causes the overproduction of ADH, magnocellular neuron tumor. Irritates the magnocellular neurons. They crank out too much ADH. You're going to retain too much free water. And eventually, when that gets bad enough, you're going to start to swell because of that. Adrenal gland. Talked about one of these, didn't we, I think? If not, we're going to, again, but overproduction of aldosterone. We know what aldosterone does, right? Retains salt and water. So too much aldosterone, you get too much salt and water. And clinically, you're going to present, probably the first thing that will show up is some edema around the ankle, some dependent edema. But that's an early clinical sign of that. Uh, and there that is, again, a little more official. So hyperaldosteronism is known as primary hyperaldosteronism. Boards aren't going to say that. They're going to use this one right here, Kahn syndrome. 
Kahn syndrome, most common cause of secondary hypertension. People have never had hypertension in their life, all of a sudden they have hypertension. Uh, a lot of times it's a problem with the adrenal gland over secreting. Um, so every, again, we've said this a million times, too much aldosterone is released. Uh, this is not driven, because remember, if you have too much renin, uh, you can overproduce angiotensin two and overproduce aldosterone that way, second most uh, best stimuli for glomerulosa cells. Um, but this got nothing to do with it. Kahn syndrome, the adrenal gland is flat out secreting aldosterone without anybody telling it to do so. And we know what aldosterone does. It increases the reabsorption of salt and water. Get yourself uh, an edema. How about an injury to a blood vessel? And burns in particular, we already said this. So you leak albumin out, and yeah, you have no power to return interstitial fluid. You're going to get a general swelling all over your body. Injury to a joint, yeah, it can cause isolated uh, an effusion, right, which is still a swelling. Allergic response, I think we're going to take a look at that more. But yeah, if you have anaphylaxis, you can swell like crazy. Uh, so here's an example of an effusion. Somebody, some athlete, you've seen a whole scar here from a surgery, I think a skier. And now we got another injury, and but that's called an effusion. That's not an edema. Sorry, gross picture. I wish I could warn you guys. Um, yeah, so there's a patient really badly burned, but you can see, I mean, he's so swollen up, just really sad to see. Why is he so swollen? Because all the burned has caused the albumin to leak out into the interstitium, and there's no way for the interstitium to return that excess interstitial fluid. They swell like crazy. So the lymph system is trying to drain away the interstitial fluid, but completely overwhelmed. Uh, lymph capillary system is another way you can swell. That called lymphedema, if you know, but a lot of times you don't know the cause of it. Um, so if, but if the lymph, well, I'm not going to draw that, but you, I've drawn that before. The lymph capillaries, of course, drain the uh, the interstitium. They're with all the capillaries. But what if those pipes get clogged? What if you have a metastatic disease or you have a cancer in the tissue and the cancer is starting to get sucked into the vacuum cleaner? Um, not good. That cancer will pile up in the in the lymph vessel, or probably it'll pile up in the lymph node, and you'll get a beaver dam, and therefore everything upstream will swell, including your leg or whatever is uh, upstream to that legs or arms. Um, you could have an adjacent tumor. People with neurofibromatosis have those tumors that compress, and they have trouble with swelling downstream from their compression. Uh, filariasis is a really common one. Um, and those those worms, those Bancroft roundworms, those guys love to burrow into the lymph system. They don't like the blood vessels. They like the lymph system. But they cause a beaver dam and people swell. And I think there's some gross pictures coming really quick here. Um, uh, let's see. So yeah, so with lymph lymphedema, that's usually a more localized, isolated to a leg or both legs. It's not your face and your whole body. We said lymphedema is the cause if you can figure out what it is. Okay, so here's a third world country. A guy came in and said, "Yeah, I think I better get checked." Uh, so he's a mess, right? So he's got he's got filariasis, chronic filariasis. And in fact, it's so bad, it's been, you can tell it's been there a long time um, because he's got hemosiderin stains. If you have such high pressure in your lower extremity, it can drive the red blood cells into the interstitium and they explode and release hemosiderin. And that stains, like getting a tattoo, it permanently stains your skin. This is a more normal looking, this one's severe here. Um, but yeah, that's what he's got. Um, we already said this one, but here it is in stone, aortic valve stenosis, mitral stenosis. We already talked about how that can be a beaver dam and back up into the lungs, the liver. Uh, spleen, that's supposed to say spleen there. Uh, peritoneal cavity. Yeah, all that whole drawing that I did. 
A decreased cardiac output uh, can also do it. We already talked about that as well. I've got some duplication I could cut out of here. What about vitamin B12? We kind of talked about vitamin deficiency. We didn't get so specific, but yeah, pernicious anemia. Vitamin B12 deficiency can eventually start to present with some swelling. So you need vitamin B12 uh, to make methionine, uh, and you need methionine to make albumin in the liver. So if you don't have vitamin B12, you can't make albumin, and you're going to get what kind of swelling? It's going to be localized or general. If you can't make albumin, it's going to be everywhere is going to be affected. You're going to swell everywhere, right? Um, what can cause vitamin B12 deficiencies? Pernicious anemia. We'll talk about this in depth, about how that works. Uh, malnutrition, malabsorption, especially Crohn's disease, uh, can cause can cause vitamin B12 deficiency. And, I mean, we also need vitamin B12 to make the myelin around our nerve fiber. Uh, so people might walk into your office complaining of bilateral leg pain and maybe some upper extremity pain. And the first thing you do is order B12 if no, if they have not had their B12 tested, because uh, that for sure can do it, but can also cause swelling because you can't make albumin with this stuff. All right. Crohn's disease. What's the deal with Crohn's disease? What's that got to do with vitamin B12? Well, we'll learn the distal ileum, uh, the intrinsic factor in vitamin B12 complex, only binds to a, a small region of the distal ileum that has these special receptors that are called like when Batman would punch the Joker in the old cartoons, kabam, kaboom, kabam. They're called kabam receptors. And Crohn's disease loves the distal ileum. And so the these receptors get damaged and you can't absorb vitamin B12 and you become deficient and you may show up with some swelling. More, yeah, more stuff. COPD can cause, how can COPD cause swelling? How can that be, well, COPD, what is that stuff? That's chronic bronchitis, it's emphysema, that's a, COPD is a double, cat, like a parent category. It's got two children, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, and that, that they wreck the lungs, and they scar up the microcirculation, and it makes it very difficult to pump blood through scarred up lungs so that the lungs act like the beaver dam. And we don't have to go back to that picture, do we? But the lungs, um, so you'll get a Kuzmol sign. Jugular vein will pop out when you take a deep breath. Uh, your liver will start to swell. You get a hepatomegaly because of the blood. And it can go on and on. It can go to the liver and then down you can get ascites, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it sure can. Uh, it sure can cause cause swelling. Uh, and corpulmonale. We'll talk about that when we get to the heart, but corpulmonale, does anybody know what that means? Oh yeah, right heart failure, okay. But what does it really mean? You only diagnose someone with corpulmonale if the cause of the right heart failure is secondary to a lung problem. In other words, they have to have COPD or one of the other obstructive pulmonary diseases out there. Um, so the most common, what's the most common cause of right heart failure? Left heart failure. But that would not be diagnosed with, the patient wouldn't be diagnosed with corpulmonale. Right, here's a little cartoon. Um, so here's the microcirculation, right? Here's, uh, let's see, who can we use? Let's use this one right here. Because here is a pulmonary artery coming from the heart with deoxygenated blood. And we'll just use this one right here. So it goes into here. This is microcirculation, right? So COPD damages the tissue in the parenchyma of the lung around here makes it difficult for the blood to get through this darn thing. Uh, and so the beaver dams can be all of these guys right here. Uh, and therefore, it uh, backs up into the uh, into the right heart and wrecks the right heart. And it uh, cheats the left heart, too, because you're not going to get good blood flow coming out of here. There's a reflex spasm that occurs because you have hypotension coming down here. So you start releasing endothelin in here uh, to kind of boost up the pressure. Um, 
but that causes other problems. I'm getting off track. Uh, but anyway, that's the story with that. Uh, what else causes swelling? Histamine. Yeah, what if you're allergic to something, right? Mast cells, uh, they release histamine. Causes increased capillary permeability. Interestingly, it actually shrinks the endothelial cells of blood vessels. It shrinks them so much that it wrecks the tight junctions and you can allow fluid to seep in between uh, intercellularly, between the endothelial cells. So super wide gaps. Uh, and that's not a good thing. Uh, so you get way too much blood fluid bombing the interstitium. The lymph system can't suck it all away. The albumin system can't suck it away, so you start to swell. Uh, histamine also affects, here's another cartoon of that met arterial, but it can affect these, can affect these guys, the precapillary sphincters here. Right? So it, uh, it binds to those. There's binding sites for those things. And it opens them up. And so you got way too much blood flowing in here where you're not supposed to have blood flowing in here. It binds to these two. So you have too much tissue and it gets hot and swollen and stuff like that. Too much blood pours in. More stuff. We kind of starting to overlap here, but cancer, specifically Hodgkin's disease and non-Hodgkin's disease, uh, can fill up. Those, those cancer cells can clog up the lymphatic system. And you, there you got yourself a beaver dam. And so you can get kind of a lymphedema from, uh, from Hodgkin's and not Hodgkin's disease. Right. We already said lymphedema before. What causes it? Um, oh, more of it, more swelling. Uh, now, what about what about an injury to the valves? We haven't talked about the, the lower extremities. We will more, but sneak preview. Uh, so let me draw one of my famous feet here. There's a leg. This is why I don't draw, right? Okay, ankle, there's a nice big calf here. Okay. Uh, and so... We have, let's see, we'll make them green. We have, oh, I'm going to exaggerate this. So we have, oh, let's use the peroneal vein, or let's use the posterior tibial vein. Doesn't matter. But we have these big veins here. Uh, and But you got gravity coming down. How in the world is blood going to get up out of this thing? Gravity's not going to let it very good. Well, the calf muscle pump's going to help pump it up. But you have all these valves. Let me see, let me make this about pink you got all these valves here so when you're up and walking around or just standing and swaying back and forth uh, the blood can squeeze up a few inches and then if gravity takes over and pulls it back down these valves will pop open and catch the blood so it doesn't return uh, so great what happens if you have a blood clot and you wreck these valves that's a problem if you don't have valves some people aren't born with valves, but most of the time it's from blood clots uh, that wreck these veins. And, and therefore, all your blood gets pooled down here. And not only does it cause swelling, but that pressure starts can damage the skin. We'll see an example of that uh, in a little bit. Um, but that's called chronic venous insufficiency. is usually the cause of venous hypertension or venous stasis. All that means it's a vein problem where too much blood is trapped for too long in your lower extremities. And it can get so bad if the swelling gets bad enough. Like if this is your cell, here's a blood vessel. And normally, let's say here's a pizza. Pizza just dropped off. Okay, there's not too much swelling, so the pizza is able to find the target but now what if you are all swollen and let's say this is just fluid and you got tons of fluid here well the pizza gets dropped off and it has trouble getting through all this fluid 
Same with waste. After eating the pizza, you make waste. You can't get rid of the wastes. Uh, so the cell can die. Uh, and that's one of the problems with any type of ischemia uh, or any type of swelling. If it gets bad enough, it can kill the cells uh, because they can't get food and they can't get rid of their waste. Uh, let's see, tissue injury from acute or chronic swelling. Yeah, we're talk that's what we're talking about. So uh, interstitial swelling increases the distance. That's the little thing I just drew. Interstitial swelling increases the distance for the diffusion of the pizza. Not the pizza, of course, but oxygen and nitrogen and other, other necessities that are pushed out of the capillary. Uh, and yeah, and waste can't get out, and you can get tissue ischemia and even tissue death if you don't do something about that chronic swelling. And the dematous tissue is definitely more susceptible to injuries, skin changes. And you can tell people like this. They get these skin changes, telangiectasia, brawny indurations, um, stasis dermatitis. They can get skin death. They can get gangrene. So we'll take a look at some of these changes. Uh, so here's a patient with chronic venous insufficiency. She had bilateral DVTs. Um, she has factor V Leiden disease, which if you don't know, you will by the time you're done with this course. One of the most common causes of blood clotting. Um, but yeah, so she's she's not too bad, right? There's no she doesn't doesn't have brawny indurations like the guy with the uh, the filaria, uh, but she's got swelling. And if you look closely over here, she is getting some skin changes. There's an old lesion right there. Uh, so this is getting pretty bad. You can see the sock marks and stuff. But uh, yeah, this is a patient. There's nothing wrong with her liver. There's nothing wrong with her heart. The problem is the veins in her legs are shot, and there's no valves, so she can't clear the blood out of her lower extremities, and it piles up here. And if something, if she doesn't wear compression stockings, which she's not, um, it can start causing skin changes. And it also greatly increases the chance for another blood clot. Here's another sign uh, of this. And this is called telangiectasia. And we got a little bit of briny induration, a little color change starting. Uh, but this is a sign. Now right here, they're in the hospital and their leg is not all swollen up. But uh, this is a sign that this ankle has been abused and swollen for a long time. This is a sign of venous insufficiency. Telangiectasia in this area here. And, oops, um, this area right in here is called the gator area. I forget one fashion student told me it's something in Europe or something. There's a gator or there's something that covers this. I, don't, I always thought it was a gator used to bite them in their ankles or something. But they call that the gator area. And these changes, this is a high pressure zone, the changes usually occur in this gator area here. Right? Here's a uh, person recovering from blood clots who lost deep femoral artery. And yep, they're a retail clerk and nice flat feet, right? Pronated feet. Uh, but yeah, so they've got brawny induration here from venous insufficiency at risk for another blood clot. And that's those are hemosiderin stains. Kind of talked about that already. And whoops, gross picture alert. Uh, and you can see all the hemosiderin stains here on this guy's foot. So he's battled this a long time, but um, he didn't wear his compression stockings and he developed an ulcer. The tissue started dying because it was so swollen. Couldn't get the pizza to the cells and the cells died. And that's what uh, an ulcer, formed an ulcer here. And yeah, I mean, how people wait so long is just beyond me. How some people walk in, I mean, how could you think he should have come in years earlier? Uh, but now he's got gangrene. So this is a uh, venous insufficiency patient. I think he also has Berger's disease too. It was more than just venous insufficiency. Uh, but yeah, the skin's day's got dry gangrene. He's got a, he's a waiting to have his both his uh, feet am amputated. That stuff can get in the bloodstream and kill you. Septicemia. 
Uh, swelling a telltale sign. Pitting edema is, when we get to the lab, we'll talk about that a little more, but how to check for pitting edema. Um, but yeah, pitting edema is when you have an overload of interstitial fluid uh, and you can put your finger and push and it causes a pit. And uh, the free water buildup in these tissues is said to be translocated by finger pressure and it leaves a dent. Everybody, if you eat a couple bags of potato chips and um, stay on your feet all day, you come home, you'll have some swelling. You could probably get a little pitting edema, but you, these guys get a pitting edema and it stays for you know, minutes, if not an hour or so. Uh, but there's a pit from this guy swollen. Right? I can't remember what the problem was with this one. That's a nice example of pitting edema. Here's a, another patient with some nice pits here. Okay, should always be tested. And this just goes to show you, might as well just make my point right now. So if we could draw, that's a bad color, let's go blue. So if I could draw his tibia, remember that sharp edge of the tibia, that anterior border? So remember Tom, Dick, and Harry are the muscles that live over here. So but remember, there's bone here. There's the medial surfaces here of the tibia. So where do you check for pitting edema? You push your fingers in here. I guess I'm come, I'm off a little bit. But this is where you check for pitting edema. Don't push over into all this muscle. There's no worry to trap it. You have to trap it against the bone. Um, but that's where you check for pitting edema. Everything I said... Check the lateral mal the malleoli as well, and check the medial tibial surface, not the lateral tibial surface. Stasis dermatitis. So let me take a drink of water here. So you can get if if your cells all of a sudden get cut off from pizza, from food, because of swelling, you can get an acute skin injury called cellulitis, where the skin starts dying. Um, you can get an eczema rash if it's a chronic thing as well, uh, but you can get a flat-out cellul cellulitis from venous insufficiency. It usually shows up in the gator area, uh, and it can be fixed by compression stockings, or better yet, elevate your feet in a nice cold room and a cortisone cream to combat the inflammation of the skin. The skin starts dying, you're gonna get an inflammatory process to clean up the dead skin. So here is a CVPP professor I know on vacation last summer in Hawaii, not wearing his compression stockings like his wife told him to do. And so he's walking around, his wife goes, your feet, your ankles are getting a little red there, buddy. I go, oh, I think I got a little sunburn. And I kind of knew what's going on, but who wants to wear compression stockings when you're in Hawaii? Uh, so, yeah, so that's a cellulitis starting right here. Uh, I didn't realize it'd get this bad. I do have a problem with uh, venous insufficiency. And yeah, I developed a stasis dermatitis and skin started dying, started getting inflamed. So this is in about 10 o'clock going to breakfast. Now you want to see what I look like later on that evening when I still didn't get off my feet this day. I kept going, we're walking around and doing stuff. So there is that same night. And yeah, so that, luckily it, the timing was good because there's torrential rain pour the next day. So we sat for three hours in the doctor's office waiting so I could get some cortical steroids to calm this down. So I put cortical steroids on this, stayed in the room, cranked up the air, elevated my feet, and I was pretty much better to go the next day. I did have to wear my compression stockings. My wife was going to strangle me with them if I didn't. But you can see I tried to give you a little pit right there where I pushed my finger in there. Um, but yeah, I came out of this. Usually when I'm back here, in the, here I don't usually have to wear compression stockings unless I'm going to be on my feet without a place to get it. You'll notice I have a recliner in my office so I can get off my feet. But if I have to, to 
go in a plane or something, I always wear compression stockings. Uh, not so much. I mean, this is it wasn't fun either. It didn't feel the greatest. The problem is it increases the risk for blood clots. And we'll talk all about those when the time comes. What are some treatments for edema? The ones I just talked about, elevation, uh, cold therapy, uh, and diarrhea. If that doesn't work, you can take some diuretics, like Lasix is the classic one uh, that's been around. Uh, they're called water pills sometimes. Uh, they block, how do they work? They block aldosterone receptors. And yeah, aldosterone can't bind to the kidney. Uh, and therefore, uh, it can't, the water just goes right out, right? You can't pull water back in. And here's compression stockings. So I think I took some, I had a whole bunch of stuff, but trust me, they work. There's Maybe it'll come up later. I have a study on this, but there's meta-analyses on these. Uh, and they definitely prevent uh, bug clots. And it was tested on airplane. Perfect place to test it on people who are on long air airplane rides, like over to Europe and such. Not only do they sit for a long time, but the cabins are pressurized to about similar to being at 8,000 feet or so in the air definitely increases the risk for uh, embolism formation and thrombus formation. So they definitely work. Um, yep, And they have a graded, the way they're just not a regular sock, but they're super, super tight down here. And then as they go up, they get looser and looser and looser. And that pushes the damaged valves back together. Uh, and then it just squeezes the interstitium. It's hard to flood the interstitium if it's so squeezed. Uh, and so that's the theory behind them, and they work pretty good. And, yep, everything I said there. Are we about done? Are we about done here? Let's just do a couple of these, and then we'll call it call it a day. Actually, it's night. It's What time is it? It's Monday night, I think. All of a sudden, I got a second wind. I thought, I'll do this while my internet's still good. We got so many people sheltered in place. Like, during the day, it's really hard for me to upload these videos. At night, they fly up. Um, so, hence, I'm a night owl tonight. Uh, thrombus, uh, Robbins had to say about that, is one of the scourges, like that, scourges of modern man. Scourges of modern man, like the coronavirus, the scourge of modern man. Uh, because it underlies very serious conditions, all types of cardiovascular disease. It's got its little hand in so many deaths in the country. It's just ridiculous. Uh, so let's talk about thrombus and emboli. And let's do it right here. We'll go over it again. But thrombus is, you want to say, a blood clot. I think I've actually told you about this, haven't I? Thrombus is a formation of a blood clot but it's got more stuff in it than a blood clot does. So it's called a thrombus formation. It's on the surface of, it's endothelial surface, endocardial surface you can have in the heart. Uh, and when it gets big enough, the problem is not only does it cause a beaver dam, a uh, piece can break loose. And there we have a bomb flying through the blood headed toward the lungs. Uh, but you never know, maybe the patient's got a, patent ductus arteriosus and pulmonary hypertension and it may jump into the right side of the or left side of the heart and go up to the brain and kill them. Uh, so these things are, who knows where they're going to end up. And we'll talk a lot about those. Let's do some definitions and that's it. Thrombus is the process of forming an unwanted blood clot within the blood vessel wall or within the heart. So on the endothelium or on the myocard or endocardium. Uh, so it starts to develop on the endothelium, endocardium. Venous thrombosis just means it's thrombus formation, but it's in a vein. And it's pretty much understood uh, like a venous thromboemboli. It's understood that it's come from the deep system. It's come from the deep femoral vein or the popliteal vein or the posterior tibial vein. Those are the ones that spawn. The bigger the vein, the more dangerous they are. Arterial embolisms are super dangerous, especially if they occur in the heart. They love people with atrial fibrillation, we'll talk about. Uh, they form in there all the time. And a very common cause of stroke, people with AFib, huge problem, right? You see all the commercials all the time, huge problem. And they got to be on blood thinners or 
they're going to be in trouble. Thrombus is just an unwanted coagulation of blood on the luminar surface. Talked about this already. Uh, it, it has some platelets, fibrin, and trapped cellular elements. And yeah, they can be real tough if those break loose. Thromboembolism is thrombus. It's thrombus, but it's broke loose. Embolism means a bomb. It's broke loose. So it's a piece or maybe all of the embolism that has broken off the thrombus, the main body of the thrombus. And uh, it could be in an artery or in vein. In this word, we can't tell. You would assume if you say thromboemboli, you always assume it came from a vein. Uh, they'll say arterial thromboemboli if they want to make the point that it came from an artery. A uh, patient lost part use of his hand. Uh, he had thoracic outlet syndrome. It compressed the subclavian artery, swirled the blood there, caused a uh, caused an embolism, and it went down and got stuck in his radial artery. And he didn't have dual circulation. He lost part of his hand. Uh, but that would be an arterial thromboembolism. If they just say thromboembolism, just assume it comes from the vessels. Uh, you could in, make leave no doubt. You could say a venous thromboembolism. That way, it came from vein. Uh, thrombophilia. So I like this. You can see I always write a question on this. There's some strong AKAs, but what's a hemophilia? Hemo is blood. Philia is likes to do it, likes to bleed. Uh, so this is thrombo means clotting. So or form thrombus. So these are people who like to form clots. Uh, so that's an older word. It's still on boards, but uh, it's not a great medical word. Uh, a hypercoagulable state is the preferred word, meaning the blood is coagulates very easy, or prothrombogenic state, or prothrombogenic disease. Um, so these are better words, but I've heard this is still on boards. Uh, a person who has any condition which increases the risk for thrombus formation is a thrombophiliac. So that's better to that's confusing to people. It's better to say they have a hypercoagulable state or they have prothrombogenic disease. But uh, don't forget that one. That's why I put it first because that does tend to show up on boards. Okay, oh my gosh, look at all the slides. Let's start this one. Let's call it a night here. It's a good place to start. I didn't do my backup, so we got to pray to the Cam Camtasia gods that this does not disappear and it works. All right, see you in the next video.